So I was at one of these training programs, and uh, it was a tea break, and I was silently sipping my tea in the corner of the room, and I see this man, a fully grown up, almost 40 year old man, and he walks up to me. He seemed jittery and nervous, so he walks up to me, and he just stands in front of me. So I sensed that he wanted to say something, but he wasn't able to find his voice. I knew he wanted to communicate, so I, I make him comfortable, and I start initiating this, this conversation, and I say, is there something that you would like to talk about? So this man, very reluctantly, with almost a quiver in his voice, in a very low tone, tells me, Madam, I masturbate. And I'm here, standing in front of him, looking at his face. My jaw drops, and I say, OK. And then he continues. Madam, I masturbate a lot. I do it three to four times in a day sometimes. Now, while I was looking at this fully grown man standing in front of me, I knew there was something that was fundamentally troubling him. It was almost as if he had carried this question on his shoulders for the entire life. I could see the expanse of time with which he had lived with this question, and he really wanted to get an answer. And probably asking me was not the most appropriate things for him to do, but it was the closest to an appropriate scenario that happened in his life. So then I asked him, is everything else OK in your life? He became confident, and he said, yes, yes, everything else is OK. I'm married. I have children, I have a caring family, all is well. But I masturbate a lot. Is it OK? And I looked at him and I said, yes, it's fine. It's OK. He was visibly relieved. He said, thank you. He walked back to his chair. And for the rest of the day during my training, I saw him participate with confidence and commitment. And this is not a one-off incident. Because almost in every single training program that we conduct, we have seen adults, fully grown adults, ask us some of the most fundamental questions about sex and sexuality. Is it OK to watch porn? I am a man and I'm attracted to men. Is it OK? And in 99% times, all they want to hear is that it's OK. So isn't it crazy to think how an entire generation of adults in this country, my parents, your parents, and all the adults that we see around us, have not been told that it's OK to explore your sex and sexuality safely and responsibly. And isn't it scary to think that this generation of grown-up people have lived potentially in ignorance, confusion, ambiguity, guilt, and shame for the whole of their lives. And these are the adults who are supposed to take care of our children, who are supposed to nurture them, who are supposed to teach them, decide their curriculum, develop policies for our young people, basically decide the future of our future generations. And some of them sit on really powerful chairs. So they sit on these powerful chairs, and then they say, don't talk about sex. Not in the classrooms, not in our textbooks, not in our movies, not in our homes, not in public. And they say, don't talk about sex and sexuality, because nobody spoke to them. And this is a strange paradox in a country where the population is 1.3 billion. Of course, we are having a lot of sex. And only time we as a society talk about sex is when gruesome episodes of sexual violence against women and children come to light. And while the outrage against sexual violence is extremely, extremely pleasing and a relief for many of us working on this issue, 
some of the outcomes that we demand as a society are so naive and medieval. Castrate the rapists, hang them, treat 16-year-old children as adults if they commit heinous crimes, jail them, kill them, lock them away. All our solutions, suggestions, and investments to tackle the problem of sex sexuality and sexual violence come from a fear-based approach, where all we want to do is tame the perpetrator. And we also use shame as a very, very powerful external force to put our young people in place, because we don't have their best interests in our mind. We use sexual shame to harm them. And sadly, as a country, we have now gone beyond shame, and we have started punishing our young people for expressing their sex and sexuality. Because as on date, two 17-year-olds in this country cannot kiss. It's illegal, and if they are caught, one could go to prison. So recently, I was in Mumbai, and I was attending a conference where a senior women's rights activist, Dr. Meena Gopal, said something that stayed with me. She said that sex education is going to be the bedrock of change. And when we say sex education, we have to understand that it has to be comprehensive sexuality education. It does not mean that we teach young people about men and women having sex, about how to have sex and what not to do when you're having sex and when not to have sex. Comprehensive sexuality education actually empowers our young people with knowledge, skills, and values that they basically require to be able to grow as young and confident adults. It helps them develop emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and it basically encompasses all the emotions that we go through when we experience relationships. Because when I say sexuality, it's much beyond sex. It's about what two people go through when they are in a relationship. Jealousy, attraction, confusion, care, concern, responsibility. All of this encompasses sexuality. And we don't want to talk to our young people about this. And we do not educate them. In spite of this being the fundamentals of who we are, generations have gone by without talking about this. Now, I was also a part of this generation. I was 22 when the first time I got exposed to sex and sexuality. It was a full-day workshop by India's first female sex educator, Dun Pantaki, was an absolute rock star. She started this work in 1967, when most of us were not even conceived. And she started talking about sexual behavior and healthy sexual development among children and young people. So it was a session by Dhun Ma'am, and we were in college. And she pulled me out in one of her sessions, and she asked me to sit on a chair. She asked me to close my eyes, and she said, Uma, Think of your wedding night. And think about everything. What you could do, what is going to happen, what you're wearing. Think about your wedding night. Now, I was sitting on this chair, and my mind was flipping. My mind froze. I did not know what to think. I did not know where to start. And the closest I could get was, I thought of a bed full of flowers and a heart of roses, and probably a scene from the movie Border, where Sunil Shetty and his wife are having his first night. I couldn't think. And I could hear Ms. Pantaki's voice in the background, where she's encouraging me to explore my sexuality and think deep about what are the possibilities. And then I hear my classmates giggling in the background, and I knew this was going to be a disaster. After a few minutes, she asked me to open my eyes, and then she says, OK, Uma, tell us, what did you see? 
And I was flipping again. What should I tell her? Of course, I was not going to tell her about the heart of roses because I knew I was going to be heckled for the rest of my time in college. So I said, I saw a bed full of flowers. And then she probed further. And then? I said, I saw my husband and me. She said, OK, what were you doing? I was completely taken off guard. I wasn't ready for this. So I said, we were talking. <laughs> so then she said, what were you talking about? And sheepishly, innocently, stupidly, I said, I asked him what his hobbies were. <laughs> and the reaction was like this. My entire class burst out laughing, and quite frankly, I don't remember what happened after that. Now, the reality is, as a young person who was 22, I knew what I had to say. I knew I had to say something about sex and sexuality. I knew that I had to talk about my intimate sexual experience with my husband. But I did not know how to say it. I did not know how to say it. I did not know how to visualize it, because I did not have any points of reference. And I would imagine that most of us, most of our young people and children, feel the same. We have very weak points of reference. And as a young girl who was born and brought up in a small suburb in Mumbai, in an orthodox South Indian family, I was not even allowed to think about these things, leave alone doing it or experiencing it. I remember the first time the movie Murder came on cable television. Me and my sister literally ran to watch it at my friend's place, only to realize that the cable guy had cut the main lovemaking scene in the movie. <laughs> so we didn't have access to education, we didn't have access to resources, and that is what our young people and children are facing even today. So what are we doing to our young people and our children? And we see this time and again in our training programs, where we do this very interesting exercise, where we pull out adults from the audience, and I tell them very simply, you have to come and just name the parts of your body. From your head to toe, just name all the parts of your body. Every single training program we conduct, adults will name everything. Sometimes they name their intestines and their appendix. <laughs> but they will never name their penis, their vagina, their buttocks, their anus. And then you ask them why. And you get all kinds of reasons. These body parts are private. These body parts are sexual organs. And they're not supposed to be spoken out loudly. We cannot talk about it. And then I ask them a simple question. So if my penis, my vagina, my breast, and my buttocks are private, does that mean the rest of my body is public? And if these are the only organs that are sexual, does that mean I don't use the rest of my body for sex? So what are we doing by sexualizing these body parts and confusing our children and young people? And this is how we started literally perpetrating the culture of silence and shame. And the vicious cycle continues. So if we really have to change some of these things, fundamentally, it's important that we start talking to adults first about sex and sexuality and start addressing some of these issues that they have faced as children and young people. Because we are the ones who tell our children, break the silence, be confident, tell us if you need something, tell us if somebody is abusing you. And what do we do when they break the silence? We don't know how to respond. Because imagine a policeman who is sitting in front of a victim of rape, and the victim says, he inserted a rod in my vagina, and this policeman cringes. Who needs to be taught about sexuality, and who needs to be sensitized? So it's high time that adults take responsibility and start looking at this. Thus, it's time for the same patriarchal mindsets that have ruled us and ruined us 
to take some accountability. And it's time that men and boys start this change. Because if men don't initiate this change now, the notion of masculinity is poisoning the well from which our men and boys are drinking. It's become a toxic pool which is actually affecting our men and boys as much as it's affecting our women and girls. Because we have forgotten to talk to our men and boys about consent, about boundaries, about relationships, but also about the possibility of abuse. In our experience, we have seen that when men are victims of sexual violence, the guilt, the shame, the trauma is crushing because somewhere masculinity tells you that you are powerful and you can never be abused. And if you're abused, you can never seek help. And this is problematic. And of course, there is a complete non-representation of people who do not fall into this heteronormative framework. Because we as a society don't identify anything which is beyond a man and a woman and a husband and wife relationship. Anything outside is deviant and problematic. Also, we must start treating our children and young people as sexual beings because they do have sexual feelings and they do experience sexuality and they do express it. It's normal and it's healthy. So it's high time that we as adults, as parents, as peers, talk to them about healthy sexual behavior and we talk to them. We don't ask schools to do it. We don't ask NGOs to do it. We do the talk. There's no right time. There's no right age. It's when the child or the young person is ready. Now, I want you all to imagine a young girl from a mi marginalized community, a minority religion, a backward region in the country. She is disabled and she is lesbian. Ask yourself, can this young girl free fall through life as you and me would? Can she express herself, be confident about her sexuality, and still be accepted in this society? And if the answer is yes, that's the day we can truly say that India is a developed nation. Thank you.